Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your Viceroy of verisimilitude, or as John Campia calls me, your existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, me, Robert Meyer Burnett. And this is a mailbag for Tuesday, June 29th? 28th. 28th. June 28th, I stand corrected. So there's only a couple more days uh, left of June. And of course, as you know, during the John Campia show, you can, when we open up the Super Chats, fire in a question live on the show, and we will read it. But if you can't make it anytime, 24-7, wherever you are around the world, you can send us a tip with a question, and if we deem that question appropriate... We will read it right here on the mailbag. The link is right down there in the description. Fire away. And let's see what you've got for us today. A B DeVeers or DeVillers. Hi, Rob. How does one from Stranger Things, how does one from Stranger Things 4 get his powers? From spiders? Why doesn't one kill Papa, but just injures him? seeing as he hated him the most. There could be a twist. Why does Vecna or Upside Down Monsters target only teens? Well, A.B., these are questions that uh, I often ask myself. You know, I think the funny thing about Stranger Things is if you really think about it, why only Hawkins and Russia? Why are those the only places that you can get into the Upside Down? Because is the Upside Down a complete duplicate of our world? So could you go anywhere in our world and go into the Upside Down? I mean, you know, as somebody who is a, a big fan of horror, one of the things you have to do is sort of define your horror. But you usually get one ask that you expect the audience to believe in. And I think the Upside Down is that ask. Once you believe or you think that the upside down is is the way they've done it, you believe it, like, I'll buy into that. So all of these questions that you've asked are great questions. Why why did the Demi-Gorgons always uh, target teens? Maybe they have weak minds. I don't know. But if you get too much into the logic of all of this, it can, it can fall down. And you know what I use as an example of that? You know the movie The Ring? It was the remake of Ringu, the Japanese film. If you think about The Ring... And maybe people don't know this, but I'm going to use this as an example. In The Ring, if you play a videotape that has this certain image on it, these images that were psychically projected onto the videotape, you get a phone call. And a girl on the other end of the phone goes, seven days. And then seven days later, she crawls out of your TV and scares you to death. Well, if you think about that, she's like undead. Does she have a VCR in the afterlife? Does she have a switchboard somewhere? How does she know that you've watched that videotape? She's dead. There's got to be some kind of tech connection to technology. The point is you never think about that in the movie while you're watching it. If you do think about it, none of it makes any sense. So when it comes to the, the, uh, the upside down, you just got to go with it, man. You just got to go with it. I have no answers for you. I wish I did. But hopefully we'll know at least more when these last two episodes air. Um, a, B, is it Veers? I keep thinking I'm going to get it wrong. A, A, B, De Villers. Stranger Things Volume 4 will be the Infinity War of the series. The teens will formulate a plan to take down Vecna but lose. One or two may permanently die while the others are left emotionally reeling. How do you think Season 5 will be, Rob? Well, first of all, A, B, I think that is a great assessment because season five is the end of the uh, end of the series i think infinity war and endgame are great i do think we're going to see some people die i don't want to say who i don't know who but i think it's going to be surprising but i think you're absolutely right we're going to get some major deaths and um uh and how do i think season five is going to go I think the big threat of season five is that the upside down is th going to threaten to spill out and consume our world, that our world will turn into the upside down. And that's going to be the, th the big threat. How do we prevent that? I don't know. But that's what I think is going to happen in season five. I do love your analogy of making it. This is Infinity War and we're going into the end game. I think it's great. I hope that's what happens. Now I'm excited. It better happen. I guess we'll know in two days. 
Chad Johnson says, hey, team, I was asked what my favorite films are the other day. And while I used to find that question hard to answer, now that I'm older, it's so much easier. Those movies are Inception, The Breakfast Club, Hacksaw Ridge, and Lion. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good wide ranging assortment of films. Um, I like that you you have Breakfast Club. I mean, that goes all the way back to the mid '80s. Hacksaw Ridge, great, great, great movie, great anti war film about a man of faith, and Lion, hilarious if it's the one I'm thinking about. And of course, Inception is one of my favorite films of the modern age. But even Inception, you know, it's it's what it's it's 12 years old now. Uh, I think it's a pretty good pretty good list of films. I'd, I'd be, be curious to you to hear you round that out to the 25 favorite films you have. I think that's great. I think it's a really good list. Kudos to you, sir, for having that that good taste. Ivan Preto says, "Hey, y'all." I know John doesn't do X actor plus X role questions, but I'm curious. If Scorsese were to direct a comic book film, which character do you think aligns more with his directing style? I can see him doing a Batman or a Punisher. Okay, those are good choices. You know what I think Scorsese would make the best film out of? Daredevil. Scorsese's Catholic. Uh, it informs everything he does, and Daredevil definitely has a Catholic bent to it. And you saw this in Mark in Mark Johnson's version of Daredevil that Ben Affleck starred in. But I think that Daredevil would be the movie. And plus, Hell's Kitchen in New York, make it a period piece in the 70s. I think Scorsese would knock it out of the park. Yummy Brown Bear sends in a tip and says, I finally watched The Boys for the first time this weekend. I binge watched every season all the way up to the most recent episode. It is awesome. Yummy Brown Bear, did you know anything about it? My question is before you watched it because it is awesome. And I think that uh, the extreme nature of the show, at first when you're watching, you're like, oh, my God, from that opening scene with Huey's girlfriend getting taken out by A-Train, where you just like going, oh, my God, what am I watching? Because I love that about the show. And there's some great... Great stuff in that season one, the plane episode on the airliner. <clears throat> really, really great stuff. So I'm glad you watch it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And uh, boy, we've got two more episodes of this season. I, I don't know where it's going to go. I hope we have another knockdown, drag out fight, though. Uh, Sai says, hey, John, when are you going to watch RRR? I'd love to see you and Rob review it. I don't know if we ever would review it, but man, is it cool. Uh, if you guys haven't seen RRR, it's on Netflix. The less you know about it, the better. Yes, it does come from India. Watch it. I'll say this. It's incredible. If you're open to seeing new things, I think you're going to love RRR. And then you'll find out what the R's stand for, too. Jonathan Lehman <clears throat> sends in a tip and says, James Bond Brosnan in The World is Not Enough. I thought Christmas only comes once a year. I said this to my dad after leaving the theater. That is either the cringiest or the greatest double entendre of all time. Maybe both. Of course, the problem with that is that he's saying that about Denise Richards as Christmas Jones. And if it was anyone else, it might be great. But I think it's because it's Denise Richards, it's a little cringe. By the way, I think The World Is Not Enough is actually a really good movie. Um, I, it might be Pierce Brosnan, my second favorite Brosnan film after GoldenEye. But then again, you go back and you watch Tomorrow Never Dies, it's pretty good too. I just wish that they'd fleshed it out. If you read the novelization of Tomorrow Never Dies, um, it talks a lot more about Stamper and how he had his pleasure and pain centers reversed. And then they used that, they co-opted that for the Robert Carlyle character in The World Is Not Enough. That's why... Um, they they uh, Tomorrow Never Dies has a lot of stuff cut out. That's why it seems like it's shorter, which, I mean, I still think it's pretty good. Uh, Dust in the Wind. It's pretty funny. Did you see the Variety Report about the Tarantino, Zorro, and Django movie that was in the works? It's dead, despite bringing back Jamie Foxx and Antonio Banderas as Zorro. If you were a studio exec... Is that star power worth reconsidering making the film? Well, Dust in the Wind, I would say that, yeah, but only if Tarantino directed it. 
if Tarantino wrote and directed the Django Zorro movie, then we green light it and make that film. If he's just a producer and maybe he's only a screenwriter, eh, I don't know. I don't know. But if Tarantino makes that movie, then we make it. That's the only way I think it would get greenlit. But I'd like to see it. You know, there was a comic book. Why not? I mean, I think that I think Antonio Banderas still has a lot in him. Jamie Foxx, you know, they're a little older, more seasoned. But I, I'd like to see that. It'd be cool. Why not? Uh, Cameron Nelson says, I walked into my theater today, Monday the 27th, and it was packed. Both concession lines were filled, so I can only imagine what Tuesday is going to look like since the prices are cheaper. I think movie theaters are officially back, and it makes me so happy. Well, Cameron, it's great because, you know, we're in the height of summer now. We're moving into the holiday weekend, the July 4th weekend. I've always loved July 4th. It's always a fun holiday. It's always a movie-going holiday for me. Maybe not the actual July 4th day, but the lead up to it, which is this weekend. Very exciting. Very exciting. Um, I love to hear that you, that movie theaters are back for you. When there's a lot of cool stuff to see, people will go. How good's that? It's awesome. So congrats for being in the theater and, and having that, that movie going feeling because we've missed it. Jonathan Namella says, hello, John, I really enjoy your fireside chats. Can we get an after dark show by the campfire? Well, I'll pass that along to John. I mean, look, I like when John imparts his wisdom to us, whether he's sitting by the fire, whether he's uh, uh, thoughts on walks. I like that stuff. I think he should do more of it. And you know what? If he doesn't, maybe I'll rip him off and I'll do it. And because uh, why not? Why shouldn't I? Good idea is a good idea. Uh, Jonathan Mella goes on to say, hello, John, since you have a PlayStation five now, are you going to get WWE 2K 22 or AEW upcoming wrestling games? John, there was so much fun. I think you're meaning to say there's so much fun. Are you watching SummerSlam? Bailey is going to return. Jonathan, everything I just read makes no sense to me. It's like another different language. And I apologize for being useless to you. But um, one day, John will indeed emerge, and he will be able to answer these questions. That day is probably not today, but uh, I can ask him about the PlayStation 5. Just tell him Ray loves WWE 2K22. Oh, Ray loves that WWE game for PlayStation? Right. You love it? Yeah, yeah, because it's for Xbox 2. And the AEW game looks really good. And Ray says the AEW game looks really good. He's got the He's rocking these both on the Xbox so um, there you go. You've When Ray Ora chimes in, I listen because I know nothing about the AEW or the WWF. If you ask me about the XFL cheerleaders, though, <laughs> as you know, I can tell, tell you all about those. Jonathan Mellis comes back and says, hello, Rob. Well, hello. I was named after John Hart on the TV series Heart to Heart, and my sister was named after Jennifer Hart. I was wondering... What your favorite part of the show was? Rob, do you own it, own it on DVD? And what is your favorite episode? Well, I have to tell you, I do not own Heart to Heart on DVD. My favorite part of it was that Stephanie Powers was one of our principal characters. I love Stephanie Powers. Um, I like the fact that your parents named you after that that show. I mean, it's kind of a romantic thing to do. I'm sorry, I just don't. I couldn't tell you my favorite episode. I haven't watched Heart to Heart since it aired in the '80s. But it was a good show. Um, yeah, absolutely. I wish I could. I'll have, to, I'll have to come back and do some research. But, you know, I didn't watch it religiously. It, it was not like one of my favorite shows, but it was a good show. And I've often talked, you know, I've often used Heart to Heart as an example of a kind of storytelling format, like these two debonair, beautiful people travel around the world solving crimes. I mean, what's not to love? Heart to Heart you know, you could, that's a movie, that's a movie, you could, you could remake that show and do a good movie, make a good movie out of it, I think, as long as you had the proper globe-trotting budget to do it. Jonathan Namella goes on to say, hello, Rob and John and crew. When can we have an official John Campia meet and greet for your fans? I would love John Campia to autograph my Eagle WWE belt and Ray as well. I hope we take pictures and maybe chat a bit. Well, Jonathan, we 
uh, have had, we had a hundred million views party and then we were going to have a 200 million views party, but we didn't, did we? We got a movie theater, uh, but we do meet and greet sometimes. So if you live in the greater Southern California area, there is a good chance that we will have some kind of a meet and greet or or have a fan event at a, at a certain movie opening or something. So it's not out of the realm of possibility. And I can assure you that Ray Ora is one scintillating conversationalist, so he will talk your ear off when you finally get to meet him. Um and he's a very funny man and delightful, too. So hopefully uh, that'll be sooner rather than later. Uh, Jonathan Namella goes on to say, hello, John. What is it like being a movie extra on big time sets? Well, Jonathan, uh, I'm not John, but I can tell you because I have been an extra on big time movie sets. It's boring because you have to wait and you have to wait all day usually, sometimes 12 hours to be in one scene. And I guarantee you, whenever you're a movie extra, you, you're, you're in the last scene of the day. You, you, you want to be in the first scene of the day, but you're in the last scene of the day. So for 12 hours, you sit around and wait. They say on the set, hurry up and wait. And the one thing that I love about doing it, though, or what I did love about doing it, is that you get to watch everybody work. And if you're a film fan, it's amazing to be on a set and see what it is that everybody does all day. Um, I, I never got tired of it, so I was never bored, but it is kind of mind-numbing. However, if you're in a scene, a big scene, and um, what's interesting is the first AD usually is the person that blocks the movement of extras. So for instance, say somebody's, you have a scene where someone's running down the street and you guys the extras, the people walking down the street, they kind of tell you what to do. And it's a lot of fun to be involved in uh, in shots like that. So that's kind of what it's like. And guess what? We have a sponsor for today's mailbag, and that is the great folks at Athletic Greens. Hey, guys, we want to take a second to thank the sponsor of this video, Athletic Greens. Now, when you get really busy, and you guys know that Ann and I are really busy, one of the first things that you sacrifice is eating healthy. And you know, I simply have never eaten enough vegetables in my diet, I admit it. So for a long time, I've been looking for a really good all-in-one supplement that helps me get those nutrients and vitamins that my body needs. And thank goodness, I found Athletic Greens AG1. So what is Athletic Greens AG1? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, and probiotics to help you start your day right. And for me and Ann, it's easy. We get up in the morning, we pour a big glass of water and add one scoop of AG1. So many people today are taking some kind of multivitamin and it's important to choose one with high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. And it's cheaper than getting all those different supplements yourself. And on top of giving you all those vitamins and nutrients, it also supports better sleep and quality of recovery and supports mental clarity and alertness. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash mailbag. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash mailbag to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. And many thanks to our sponsors over at Athletic Greens, which, by the way, uh, I don't eat vegetables either, just like John, so they're a great alternative. Logan James Canastin, one of four. Hey, my biggest issue with prequel stories is when the story relies on a sense of danger or peril when we already know how everything turns out including the fate of the characters. For example, in the Obi-Wan show, when Obi-Wan and Leia are being hunted, for me, it falls flat because they know they aren't in any danger. Or if I know that there aren't in any danger at all, I know what happens to the characters, so I never feel the emotion that I can tell the director is expecting or wanting me to. This is also why I didn't enjoy the El Camino Breaking Bad movie. There were way too many flashbacks of Jesse in danger when he was captured and enslaved. But again, all I kept thinking is, I've seen the series. I know he escapes. 
Let's move on from that. One last example is in Titanic, when Rose contemplates suicide. I, I know she doesn't go through with it. Even when she slips, I know she doesn't fall to her death because she's the woman at the beginning telling us the story. So once again, all sense of danger or peril is lost on me. I would love to know your thoughts. Well, Logan James, I have to tell you, uh, I think it's an art. I think if you're going to do a prequel series or a prequel story, there's a, there's an art to that. And what you need to do is you need to tell a, a, a tale about our main characters or main character that gives us insight into who they are that we didn't have beforehand. We have to know something like, for instance, one of my favorite prequel series ever or prequel movies is David Lynch's Fire Walk With Me, which was a prequel to the Twin Peaks television show. And, you know, I, well, it wasn't a pleasant movie to watch because it deals with who Laura Palmer was before she was murdered. Um, I enjoyed that because it it added to my understanding of the story and it gave me, it gave the character of, of Laura Palmer complexity and actually deep sadness because she was a, a survivor of abuse, obviously, and then was murdered, but it told me a story I hadn't heard before. So I think you're right though, when you're putting characters in peril and and you're you're putting them in danger and we know full well they get out of it, I think that that sort of I don't know, it 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 smothers the engine of drama that should be driving the story forward because you already know they're not going to be hurt. But if you can tell a story, a prequel story, when other people that we don't know, you introduce new characters into the lives of our own beloved characters, you don't know what's going to happen to them, and you don't know how our characters are going to re react to the fate of these new characters. I think prequels can work. For instance, you know, as much as I, I, I don't think the Star Wars prequels are good movies, but I think the stories they're telling are good Star Wars stories. And it was really interesting to see how that world worked and how Palpatine rose to power and what happened to the Jedi Order. I mean, even though we knew it was all coming down the pike, I still found all that stuff pretty interesting. It depends how it's done, really. Um, but I agree with you for the most part. Prequels, not the greatest idea. Uh, Joseph Michael says, with the current box office performance of Lightyear, approximately $153 million total, is it more likely that Disney will just give up on releasing Pixar movies in theaters? Their next film, Elemental, comes out on June 16th, 2023, almost a whole year from now. Well, you know, I think they're going to, I think Lightyear is an anomaly. I don't think you can say that Pixar's goose is cooked yet. Obviously, their last three films, like Soul, were released directly to Disney Plus because of the pandemic. I think that uh, the success of Pixar's light year was kind of an it was an odd duck in the sense that I think people really didn't understand is it a Toy Story movie? What is this movie? And also, you know, upon further reflection, the thing about the Toy Story toys is they're nostalgic. They're not of the '90s. Etch a Sketch, Mr. Potato Head, Woody. I mean, all these toys are like from the time when John Lasseter was growing up as a kid. So. It didn't really, even Lightyear is the, it didn't really, I used to think that, oh, it was such a cool idea. This is Andy's favorite movie. But if Andy was a child of the 90s, he wouldn't have the toys that he had in the Toy Story movies. He would have much more modern toys, but he didn't. So I think that there was brand confusion and it didn't entirely work. I think when they look at Elemental, and I think Pixar, Pixar wants theatrical releases and Disney wants Pixar movies, I think, to be theatrical releases. And I think they look at each movie. Each movie is a world unto itself. So I I think that we will indeed see a Pixar movie back on the big screen, especially a year from now, uh, if it's great. If it's not great, it'll probably wind up back on Disney+, Plus. but I hope not. Because look, Lightyear, for all of its faults, maybe if people didn't like it, it was the first IMAX Pixar movie. They finished it in IMAX. And that alone is worth celebration. Uh, Anonymous says, favorite documentary. <clears throat> also, thoughts on what is a woman documentary? 
Well, uh, that's Matt Walsh's new documentary that was produced by The Daily Wire. Um, and Matt Walsh, of course, goes in and asks the question, what is a woman? And that started a firestorm, obviously, because during the court hearings for the Supreme Court, uh, our new Supreme Court justice was asked that very question, which was a gotcha question. And especially in this day and age when everyone's talking about rights and everyone's worried about representation, look, what is a woman? I mean, you can't really say these days because you'll get in trouble no matter what the answer is. I mean, I'm a man of science. I tend to go back to scientific definitions, but I have not seen what is a woman the documentary but i do i've watched a lot of youtube videos with analysis about the film um i why i watch uh, blair white for instance she's a, a trans youtuber that i've been watching for years she reviewed uh what is a woman her review is pretty interesting but a lot of people in the trans community she's a controversial figure so i would you know i go back and watch um multiple people multiple uh commentators and and, and make up your own mind in terms of what is my favorite documentary, uh, you know what? I have to say only because it's movie related. I don't think it's the best documentary, but um, uh, uh, it's Hearts of Darkness, a filmmaker's apocalypse. Uh, it's a documentary that they used Eleanor Coppola's footage of, of Francis Ford Coppola making Apocalypse Now. And I think it's one of the great uh, movies about creating art ever made. Uh, I love that documentary, and there's so much in it that's interesting. But, you know, that's uh, it's kind of unfair. It's only because I like documentaries about movie making. But For All Mankind, which is a documentary about the Apollo program, not to be um, mistaken for the, the TV series of the same name, is also great. And I'll tell you, a recent documentary that I loved was Apollo 11. They had found 70-millimeter footage that thought that they thought it was lost forever, and they restored it of the first – uh, land, manned uh, lunar landing that mission which, which was Apollo 11 was amazing love that uh, Jonathan DeMella tips $50 Jonathan my friend my god you've been you're like single handedly supporting the channel today this is incredibly generous of you Jonathan hello John and crew are you going to Wrestlemania 39 live in LA at SoFi Stadium John, I recommend you go to a showcase of the immortals there. It's nothing quite like the spectacle of WrestleMania. Uh, I went to WrestleMania 37 live in Tampa. It was my first WrestleMania. Well, as John is not here, I'm going to consult with Ray Ora, who is here. Ray, WrestleMania 39. First of all, have you been to a WrestleMania? Yes, I have. Ray has been to WrestleMania. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Do you have your microphone? Yeah, I guess I do now. Uh, Ray, could you tell us about WrestleMania? What is your history with WrestleMania? You know, we went to the last one we went to. I don't remember the number, but it was in first San Francisco. Um, it was a really good WrestleMania. I, I Forgive me that I don't know the number off the top of my head. But for his question about this year or when it's coming to SoFi Stadium, as soon as we saw that ad pop up during, I think, this past WrestleMania, we're like, we're going. A bunch of us said while we were watching, we're going. So hopefully we could get like a box sort of, uh, you know, the ones where that fit like a whole. Yeah, man. People. And we're just going to go have a good time. Even if none of us really watch wrestling, it's, WrestleMania is always a spectacle that even if you're just casual, haven't watched for years, it's still something like, Oh, that'll be fun to go to just because it's just an event in itself. It Does it only last one day? It's, it's well, uh, I think it lasts the whole weekend. Oh. They've really, really stretched out WrestleMania to try to get, I don't know, money, whatever. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's too much, to be honest. It's a lot of wrestling. So if you're there live, it'll make it easier to watch. And it's not a popular thing to say, but the same thing with baseball with me. Like on TV, I'm like, oh, my God. But if you're there live, it's like a completely different experience. I could get through a three-hour baseball game if it's live. Nice. Same thing with wrestling. You know, I don't know. It's just a, it's a, a total, total cool experience. So, yeah, we're talking about it. Hopefully, we could get um, a box seats for a good price. WrestleMania 39 at SoFi Stadium. And you might even see Sunday, Rob. Sunday, Sunday. Rob and Jonathan there. I'd know? go. 
Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, man. Come on. I've never been to WrestleMania. I'd totally go. Um, Jonathan Mella comes back again. Jonathan, I, I, you know what? First of all, my friend, thank you so much for the incredible support you're showing this channel today. I want to think it's because I'm so great, but that's not true. It's the entire crew here at the John Campy Show. Thank you so much. Jonathan goes on to say, hello, John and Rob. I remember you having a promotions footage screen at AMC for AMC Movie Talk. John, could we get a cool trailer for the John Campia, uh, wait, the John Campia legend? Wait for it. I. I think I think he's trying to play on D and D, like the Jack Dungeons. I don't. Oh, Dungeon. Uh, this is legendary from How I Met Your Mother. It's oh, it's How I Met Your Mother. Okay. Legendary. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Campia Led. Uh, got it. Got it. Uh, you know what? I I a promo. I we could do we could do that. I don't know if we would do that. Uh, I've never watched How I Met Your Mother uh, religiously, so this was lost on me. I apologize for that. But Jonathan, I want to thank you for supporting the channel today the way you have. Um, maybe we all will meet up at WrestleMania 39 at SoFi Stadium. But thank you for the support, sir. Jonathan <laughs> Jonathan goes on to say. Jonathan says. Jonathan Namella says, John, I just got a PlayStation 5 two years later, but hard to come by. John, do you have any suggestions for PS5 games? Do you like VR games on the PS5? Is it worth it? Well, John's not here, but Ray, any... Uh, you know, uh, I I hear that the PS5 is... Act, they're actually working on a new VR system. Uh, yeah, That's I've heard supposed they... to be totally far out, like eye tracking and everything. So I would wait on that, but... There was a uh, quite a while when I had my PS4 that I really wanted to buy the VR system because it was affordable, and everything yeah. was everything was made for it. You didn't you had full games. Unlike if you buy Oculus, it's all demos. No one ever finishes a full game <laughs> for some reason. It's all techno. They did have some great games. I really wanted to play that Creed game. I'm a boxing fan. You know, maybe get a little bit of workout too. Yeah, man. And not even thinking about it. Like, you're like, whoa, why am I dropping this weight? I've just been playing this game like 24 hours a day. So, like, those games are really cool on it. I think they had, like, a shark game. I don't know. But I would wait for the PS5 VR because it's supposed to blow everything away. That might be the game changer. That might be the thing that gets me to start looking for a PS5. Wow. Yeah. I love the PS5. I mean, like, like we were talking about Ghost of Tsushima, I really love. Um you know, I, 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 I wished I loved Hot Wheels Unleashed because I love car games, but you can't get very far without buying in. I hate buying in-game mm. stuff. I feel like if I've spent 50 bucks on a game, mm -hmm. do not make me buy more stuff that I can get past the second or third level. I hate that. Yeah. But um, Jonathan goes on. Jonathan, my gosh, Jonathan. John, it is Jonathan. This is this is the Jonathan let's show just, here. Lay, let's just title the whole mailbag the Jonathan Hour. Yeah, the Jonathan. <laughs> Jonathan Namella goes on to say, "Hello, John and Rob. I'm trying to sell my comic book collection. I have several key issues, such as Action Comics number one, Amazing Spider-Man 121 and 122, the first She-Hulk, etc. I'm getting them graded by CGC right now. Rob, how do I sell these comic books but get the right price?" Uh, John, that's a great question. First of all, what you're doing is getting them graded, which nowadays people don't want to buy comics anymore. True collectors, unless they are graded by CGC. So you're doing the right thing. And then once you've done that, there's many comic book marketplaces. There's eBay. Um, eBay does a lot of these sales. But once your comics are graded by CGC, it opens up. There's many different comic book marketplaces. I would start with eBay, but you can also find places that are, are st strictly comic book sellers and people are looking for stuff. I, I just look around. I mean, start with eBay there, certainly. Put up your listings there once you get your comics back. It sounds like you got some pretty good titles. You might get some good money. That's pretty exciting. So, um, yeah, that's very, very cool. And congratulations on getting them. I mean, CGC, I've got books. I've got some books I'm going to send to CGC shortly uh, to get graded and sell them because, you know, it's always good to use comic books to pay off your house. Because, damn it, I need to do that. But congratulations. That's a good thing you've done. Hopefully it makes some cash. Uh, Anonymous sends in a tip and says, 
John and crew, do you think we could get a trilogy of Gargoyles movies based on the TV show? I believe they could make an amazing epic story with the Gargoyles franchise. I believe Peter Jackson would be perfect to bring it to life. Well, Anonymous, first of all, I love the Gargoyles animated series. I think a Gargoyles animated or I mean a Gargoyles live action movie could be great. I mean, obviously, you'd have to make one first and then it would be hugely successful. Then you could make more. And I, I think there's a call for it. I think people dig Gargoyles. You could do a really cool movie. I don't know if Peter Jackson would do it. I think he might think that's too close to what he did in Middle Earth. Um, but you never know. But I would think that, you know, you could find a filmmaker that grew up with the Gargoyles. I think Gargoyles would make a great, great movie. At least one movie. And I would love to see it in live action. I mean, obviously, you do the wings like CG. But... But I'd like to see most of the, the stuff done practically. I think it'd be awesome. So, hey, if there's a if there's a Gargoyles movie, count me in. Color me stoked. I want to go. So, yes, indeed. Bring it on. And I guess that Gargoyles question is our last mailbag question. I want to thank everybody who generously supports this channel. Jonathan Mella, this... This was your this was your show, buddy. Thank you so much for the great questions. Maybe we'll see you at SoFi Stadium for the new WrestleMania, WrestleMania 39. And for all of you, I want to thank you all for sending in questions and supporting this channel. We love hearing from you. We love getting your feedback. I want to thank producer Jonathan Voico for producing this segment of Mailbag. I want to thank Ray Ora for participating in this segment of Mailbag. I, of course, my name is Robert Meyer Burnett. You can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett. Find me on Twitter at Burnett RM. Or find me uh, at my own website, postgeeksingularity.com. We have letters. We have all kinds of things you can interact there. And we have all kinds of stories that we put up every day. So go there and check it out. And for everyone here at the John Campia Show, we thank you for your support. We thank you for your questions. And we look forward to hearing from you for the next mailbag.